anyway, it's good again to look at God's word together. And we'll just look briefly look at uh, chapter three of uh, chapter two of Joshua, which we read earlier. And I'm mindful that I may have preached on this before because I, I did it last week at, at Mount Road and I was mindful of preaching it on there before. But I promise you it's a brand new sermon <laughs> and I trust that God will speak to us through it as we, we look at it together. Um, I suppose if you want to key first, it would be um, verse 11. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God, in heaven above and on earth beneath. And I just wanted to this morning to um, look at this passage. And I'm conscious that there's bits in this passage that makes me a little bit, I would like a bit more information. And I don't know about you, but the last couple of weeks, the 24-hour news has struggled to actually fill 24 hours. And there's a lot of speculations, particularly a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it was, it's actually just speculation and gossip about a, a BBC presenter and actual news. And we like, we like stories, even we'll make up stories, you know, if we can't, if they're not right. And we've, we'd like the gaps to be filled in. And here we've got a story with some gaps in it. Um, and you think, well, these spies, for example, must have been the most stupid spies ever because everybody knew they were there. The whole city knew they were there. Why, was that? Why did Joshua send, up, send out such incompetent spies, for example? And we can say, well, you know, why were the spies not caught? Why did the, the king speak to Rahab but didn't send his soldiers to search the house, for example? Things you would think any, any sensible king would have done. But we don't need to know that. And the, gospel, the Bible doesn't need to tell us everything about what happens. Only what it needs us to know to teach us. And that's the same with every part of Scripture, isn't it? We read history, we read law, we read poetry, we read the gospel, letters, etc. And we recognise that they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. We may not always understand what is said. There may be gaps in the narrative that leaves us questions. But ultimately, and most importantly, the Bible is pointing us to Jesus Christ. Now from you know, the actual books where Jesus is mentioned, the Gospels, the four books of the Gospels, and then the letters, have only actually taken a small amount of the Bible. The vast majority of the Bible is the Old Testament, but it points all the way to Jesus Christ. And in the salvation of Rahab, it points to the salvation we get through Jesus Christ. And also, if Rahab hadn't been there, then there would have been breaking the line to Jesus Christ because Rahab was a part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And we'll look at that a bit more later. So what I do want to do first is look at the narrative, what this, what this chapter 2 tells us. And then briefly, we'll go to the New Testament, and I promise very briefly, and we'll just look at three verses that mention Rahab. In um, Hebrews, when she's uh, uh, commended for her faith. In James, when she's commended for the commended as being righteous. And then Matthew, when she, it, points, it points us out that she's actually part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So let's just think a bit about these in a bit more detail. So here we have, to set the scene, the nation of Israel about to head to the promised land. 40 years late, really. They should have been there 40 years earlier. But due to their disobedience, they had wandered in the desert. The old generation had... Sorry, I'm used to a tie mic and I wander around. So if I get away from the mic and wave at me or whatever, I'll come back, I promise. So they'd gone away. The, the old generation had passed away due to their sin. Um, they would if you read rightly, originally spies were sent out, ten spies were sent out, and only two came back giving a good report, Caleb and Joshua. They said, yes, the Lord has given us his land, let's go and take it. And they said, oh no, there's giants there, we can't go there. And the people, and God had uh, judged them, and the, the judgment was that that generation would pass away in the desert. 
They didn't end there. Even Moses couldn't enter the promised land. Because as he was dealing with the people, he struck the rock for a second time when he should have actually spoken to the rock. And therefore, it meant that he could no longer enter the promised land either. Disobedience had led to 40 years of wandering in the desert. It led to many being killed off. It led to Moses not being able to go up himself. Sin often has consequences far beyond the original sin. Whole generations were accepted because of the sin of one generation. Many were affected by it. We sometimes minimise sin, don't we? But its consequences on us, on our families, in some cases on the country, can that be devastating. But now, graciously, God had promised that the next generation would move into the promised land. And now that we're here, the other side of the Jordan, on the east side of the Jordan, waiting to go west, they'd already run some battles, and now they were sending out spies. This time not to sort of say, should we go up, because the decision was made they were going up, but to find out what was going on in preparation. Now, like I said, at this point, the story gets a bit scatty. Why did they end up in the house of Rahab? Well, we could speculate, and some of the speculation would be helpful. But I think, generally, possibly, that maybe in the, maybe in the city where there were strangers, maybe the strangers' uh, house of a prostitute would be a good place for strangers to be, because it may be a place that a lot of strangers went to. But nonetheless, they went there. And... Um, Possibly, actually, she was a shrine prostitute in the worship of their gods. Um, but if the, plan was to, if the plan was for them to hide, it failed miserably. As the king of, Jericho, the king of Jericho heard they were there. But you know what? Even bad, sky, bad spies can be used for the purpose of God. We may not always have giftings that are good, but even in this situation where these spies were obviously not very good at being spies, they encountered Rahab. And here they were, trapped inside the city. The gates were shut, but God was working out his promises. And bringing them here to Rahab was not just working out the immediate promises of them finding out about the land, but it was going to work out eternal promises that ultimately led to Jesus Christ. Ethical questions is why did Rahab lie to the authorities? Why did she hide the, Jew, uh, hide the spies, etc.? We don't need to know those. They're not important to what we need to know. But she recognizes three things about Yahweh his might, his majesty, and his mercy. In verse 10, we recognize that she had heard how the Lord had dried up the water of the Red Sea when they came out of Egypt. So 40 years of history she had heard about. And what he did to the two kings of the Amorites on the other side of Jordan, recent history, whom you utterly destroyed. Rahab understood and demonstrated by her actions that God was a mighty God. She mentions two demonstrations of his power, doesn't she? It's control over the Red Sea, control over nature, and his power to, to equip them to destroy the kings. As I said to the children, we often put God into a box. We say, God can do this much, but he can do no more than that. And actually, we'd like to keep him in that box because we can cope with a God like that. Rahab recognised that this was no God in the box. Rahab recognised this was a God, all-powerful, over all things, all nature. She was, she, was, she was from a polytheist society. They believed in multiple gods. God's over nature, etc. God's over other things. But she saw that this was one God. One mighty God who could control all things. He didn't need a God for war to help 
help her defeat the kings over the other side of Jordan. You didn't need the God of nature to help put back the Red Sea. You needed one God, the God, Yahweh. She'd heard about who God was. And that's the beginning for all of us, isn't it? We need to hear who God is. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know who God is, you're hearing, I trust, who God is. And we hear about God through the witness of our friends, through the services here, through other opportunities. You don't know God until you know about God. But if if you only know about God, then you've got further steps to take. Rahab knew about God more than, the, more than her, um, more than the people of Jericho did. Jericho's answers to hearing about God was to lock the gates, try and keep God out. But she knew a bit more than that. She was ready to trust in this God for her own salvation. And I wonder this morning, if we know about God, but we don't know God, you might have sat here and listened to Jason and others bring God's word to you faithfully over many years, and you know who Jesus Christ is. You know about what God has done. But at this stage, you don't actually know him. He's not your personal saviour. You don't know him in your heart. You only know him in your mind. Rahab had another step to take. Or two steps, actually. So she recognised his might. She recognised his majesty. She knew God was all-powerful. That was only part of it. Like I said, she she knew that God was the God. He's not just the God of the spies of the Israelites. He's not just... He's not just the God of that nation coming over that river there. But he was the God. The God over the entire world. We live in a society who has many gods and none. And I would argue, if you, if you sit here this morning and say you've got no gods, I would say, yes, you probably have got gods. They may not be idols that Rahab had on the shelf. He might be the God of money. The God of saying, well, I live my own life and I'm independent. We all have gods. We have a yearning in our heart to know God. That was put there by God. And if we don't know the one true God, then what we know is idols and things. And it might be simply be your own humanity. I'm, I'm in charge of everything. I'm the master of my own destiny, I think it was the uh, poem that, Invictus wasn't the poem that Mandela liked. We may not know the God, but we've all got God to the small G. But she knew now that this was the true God. And this is amazing, isn't it? She's not Israelite. She'd not been with the people of Israel for 40 years in the desert. She'd not been there when the Red Sea had parted. She'd not been there when they'd come across the Jordan a few, a few months earlier. And yet she knew that, Jesus, that God was the God of Israel and God of all things. She didn't need to have a 40-year, a 40-year lesson in preparing. She knew. Her heart was already prepared to know that God was God. Here was a pagan, somebody who was outside of Israel, knowing that God was God. The God who everybody should bow the knee to. The God who rules over everything. The God who was to be feared, but when you fear to put your trust in him, he will not disappoint But going back to my illustration about Jack in the Box, what sort of God have you got? Have you got a God that maybe you say, it's fine for Sundays. 
I'm quite happy to go and listen to Jason on a Sunday. That's good. But now and a half, I can sit there, have a, listen to a sermon, and have a coffee and go home. But God, I'm too busy the rest of the week. Or maybe you've got a God for emergencies. <coughs> Look, I was showing, the, showing my new students around the building, which obviously the first thing you do is show the fire alarm. If an emergency is fire, press this. And have we got a fire alarm attitude towards God? In an emergency, press this. Or do we have a God that we can say shows us good morals? We know from the God's word how to be good people. And that's fine, God. I'll do my best to be a good person. But please don't tell me I'm a sinner. I'm doing my best. Can't you see? Compare me with some other members of my family or some of my friends. How much they dishonour you. I'm doing my best, Lord. Or even more, we don't like the idea of a Jesus Christ that had to die on the cross for us. Because that implies that we need saving. But I don't need saving, Lord. I'm fine. Here Ahab was realising a lot quicker than maybe some of the Israelites who God truly was. He wasn't just the God of the harvest. He wasn't just the God of nature. He was the God of everything. Are we willing to bow the knee to an all-powerful God? Thirdly is mercy. It didn't have to end there, did it? It couldn't end there. At that point, you had good knowledge of Jesus Christ was, uh, God was, rather. But that can't end there. You can't end with knowledge. Like I said, you need to know God in your heart. And here she, you illustrate she begins to know God in her heart because she pleads for mercy. Now, therefore, I beg you swear to me by the Lord since I have shown you kindness that you also show kindness to my father's house she begged for mercy now if you know the law there were strict laws about how they were to react with, with foreigners I won't read the verse now because it's quite a long passage but from Deuteronomy 20 the law was that the Canaanites were to be destroyed their property was to be destroyed They were to be destroyed. They were to be wiped out because of their sin towards God. And if you read later in Joshua, you will see how Achan's sin, how he sort of hid the property, the the jewel with the gold, on this tent, and it ultimately resulted in his destruction because the people of Israel were going to be allowed to have the property of other, uh, other conquests, but... Because Canaan was to be, be totally destroyed, they weren't allowed this property. And so here we have the Canaanite pleading to God for mercy when the, when the law said she should be destroyed. Is this God being inconsistent? Is this God not keeping to his own word? Well, no. Where there has been justice, there's always, always been mercy. There is the law of God, which we all break constantly. But there is mercy. Our grace is wrapped up in Jesus Christ, who died for us on the cross. Yes, he was before the cross. But like Abraham, like Joshua, like Isaac, Jacob, etc. Their hope was in the future, in Jesus Christ, who would die for them on the cross as much as he died for me and you today. But see, justice told her that she should be destroyed. But mercy pointed her to to God to ask for mercy. And we've got two choices this morning. We can either appeal to God's justice 
or we can appeal to his mercy. But hold on, if you appeal to God's justice, you've got a problem. Because God is just. And if you want to stand before God and say, I've kept all your law, God. I've done everything right. Then that will not save you. Because you haven't. You can't come before a perfect God with shoddy goods. Because by justice, you should be condemned. But praise God, we are not dealt with by justice, we are dealt with by mercy. She recognised, like that song, we just, that psalm we read earlier, she recognised that she had to be under the... No, not a different psalm, rather. She had to be under the wings of the Almighty. Her help had to come from Him. The only way to escape the wrath of Yahweh was to ask for the mercy of Yahweh. She needs to take refuge under his wings. As everyone who trusts in God must do. And once she makes that request, she sees God's power, God's might, majesty, mercy. She now sees his faithfulness. If you stand before God and you ask his forgiveness for your sins and you trust in his mercy, not in his just. In, you trust his mercy and say, well, Lord, I've, I justly should be destroyed for my sins, but I plead on your mercy that I won't be. Then you'll see God's faithfulness. When anybody who takes God's promises to their heart will find that he's utterly faithful. We are not, are we? We are like leaves in the wind. We blow and we go up, we go down, we go something. But he is always solid as a rock. If we trust in him, he will remain faithful to us. Now, probably not the rope that they jumped out of the wall down. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how they had this conversation. Was it halfway down the rope when they were having this conversation? Or probably before they went down the rope. But the point was that rope couldn't stay there. So it would have been, it would have been a different cord that was hung from the window. But it was a sign of sanctuary. She would be safe in that house, providing she didn't leave that house. We don't stand behind a rope today as a sign of sanctuary. We stand behind a cross. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can only find sanctuary in the cross, in Jesus Christ our Saviour. Rahab knew that if she stayed in that flat, she kept the card that's caught in the window, and she did remain faithful to her promises, she would be safe. And we know that we trust in Jesus Christ tonight, today, this morning. If we trust in Jesus Christ, we are safe. Our sins are forgiven. We are made right with God. We have sanctuary. And yes, we can say we are sinners. But then we can point to say, our saviour, our brother, has died for us on the cross. Are you standing behind the cross this morning? Or are you still standing in your own strength, in your own power, saying it'll be all right? It won't be. You need a saviour, Jesus Christ. But thank God that if we turn to him in repentance, he will save us. Just briefly before we move on to the New Testament, for Rahab, the counsel with the, with the two spies was life-changing in every sense of the word. For the spies, it was life-affirming. They could see God was going to give them the land. He was going to complete all that he promised. I think sometimes we know God's promises. We can read them in God's word. We know them. But we know them, but we don't know them. Does that make sense? Oh, we know that people can be saved. 
And we believe God too is worthy to save people. But oh, the joy when we actually see people being saved. We know that God answers prayer. Which is why you'll all be at the prayer meeting on Tuesday. But oh, isn't the joy when we actually see God answer prayer. The spies knew that the lamb was going to give it to them. But they then had the joy of knowing it burned when they when there was in Rahab's house. So briefly then, and I'm keep saying briefly, it's looking at the clock. Um, three things we need to know about Rahab. You all know, I'm sure, the the famous passage in Hebrews 11. We haven't got time to read that this morning, but you know, if you've got time this afternoon, you go back and read it. It's encouraging. Rahab was in the line of faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, we read that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Rahab had demonstrated her faith by welcoming in the spies. Rahab could have been killed or tortured for a disobedience to the authorities in Jericho. But she had faith in Yahweh to keep her safe. As we know from elsewhere, we cannot please God without faith. And we cannot be made right with God without faith. And Hebrews says here that Rahab had faith. Someone from outside the people of Israel, someone in a sense who's outside the camp, had found Jesus Christ, uh, found God as to be faithful to her. And we need faith. Not faith in ourselves, not faith in the Bible, but faith in Jesus Christ. Faith that says, I trust you to do all that you said you would do, Jesus. I trust you to be my saviour. I believe you, you love me. I believe you died for me. I believe you care for me. I believe one day I will stand before you as my risen saviour. Yes, God doesn't speak to us in, in words that we can hear. But he's always speaking to us through his word. And he answers our prayers, even when we are faithless in our praying. Rahab had faith. And you see that list of people, that marvellous list of others that were mentioned. Little Rahab, the woman from outside the camp, she had faith. And we may not be an Abraham, we may not be an Isaac, we may not be a Jacob, or a David, or even a Gideon. But like Rahab, we can have faith. Yes, at times the faith might be weak. At times the faith might feel like it's being pulled apart. And, and using the New Testament terminology, you have to, no, never mind having faith to move mountains, you can't even have faith to move a leaf. But you have some faith. And God loves you. As your relationship with him grows, your faith will grow. And you'll see him answer prayer in your hearts and in others around you. Rahab was made righteous. We told that from James. Rahab was the pagan. She was made right through God with her faith, through her faith. Her faith in Yahweh saved her and was demonstrated through her saving the spies. The saving of the spies did not save her. But it demonstrated she was trusting in Jesus, in God for her salvation. And like Hebrews, Rahab is mentioned in James in the same breath as the patriarch. James uses two illustrations. One was Abraham and his faith. He had faith to believe God could provide a sacrifice at the very time he was strapping Isaac to the sacrificial pile in order to kill him. Rahab was shown faith by saving the spies. 
Different experiences, but same faith. You could say that, well, Abraham's faith was greater because he was willing to kill his son. But James doesn't look at it like that. They were made, both made righteous through faith. And I trust that we've all got faith in God this morning, but our faith will be demonstrated in different ways. It's ultimately to trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation, but we will demonstrate our faith and how we live. Some people in faith might be sent around the world. You might be sent across the road to your neighbour. It's still faith. It's still you exercising faith through Jesus Christ. Going out and being obedient to him in all that you do. We can't compare ourselves to other people. We all, you know, our faith is our faith in Jesus Christ. And we trust in him, just as they do. But how we demonstrate our faith in our lives will be as the Lord shows us. Yes, I know we demonstrate this in the obedience to the Bible, but your faith might call you to go to be a missionary. Your faith might call you to stay here and do a children's class. Your faith might call you to just go across the road and give a cup of sugar to your, to your, to your neighbour. I don't know. And tell them the gospel while you do it. But all our faith will demonstrate that we're Christians. Our faith, you know, the old argument about James, wasn't it? That it was, a, it was an epistle of straw because it was advocating faith that, that we're saved through works. No, we're not saved through works. But being saved, we will show works in our lives because we'll be different people. People that love, love God will act differently to those who don't. Our works will not save us. But if we haven't got works like James says, have we got faith? Rahab had faith. And she was right with God. Just as Abraham was, just as Isaac was, just as Jacob, just as all those in the role of faith were. And finally, this leads us to the final point. She was part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Rahab is mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ in Matthew. The pagan, the prostitute, was a human descendant of Jesus Christ. And here we have purposes being fulfilled. Not just the immediate purpose of the spies being saved and Israel destroying Jericho, but the long-term purpose that Rahab would marry into the house of Israel and become a descendant of Jesus Christ. We don't always know what God's long-term purposes are. And some things he's doing now, you say, why is he acting in this way? Why was Rahab saved? She's a pagan. But God was working his promises out. That in this case, we're going to be thousands of years into the future. As just as we see in Genesis about the, the, the serpent smiting the head of the smiting the head of Jesus Christ, there was a plan put in place before eternity, and that Christ would be victorious. Rea was a link in the chain leading to Christ. God's working out his promises in the short term and the long term. And you can say, well, God, why is this not happening now? Why are you doing this now? You might not get the answer now, but you might see it in the future. God doesn't work. As the young lady correctly told us earlier, God is outside time. We like God to hurry up. But God is timeless in that sense. He will work out his promises in his own time. But you know what? She's not just a great, 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 great descendant of Jesus Christ. She's his sister because he's her brother. She may have had the joy in being part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, which is more than that, just part of the family of God. Rahab was a trophy of divine grace. 
Some people prefer not to know who their families are. I've never felt the need to do one of these ancestral trees or those websites where you can look back and see that uh, your uncle Joe, 100 years ago, was in the war or something. I've never been keen to do any of that. You don't know what you're going to find. If you look back through the lineage of Jesus Christ, you find a lot of people who think, really? <laughs> it was a rum lot, wasn't it? But Matthew recognised Jesus Christ is for all people who turn to him as their saviour. Whatever their reputation, and whatever their birthplace. It might have been great that she was sent to Jesus Christ, but oh, it's more important because part of the family of God. And if Jesus Christ is your saviour today, we call it to the brother and sister, not because we're being nice, but because we're all part of the family of God. And that's far more important than to being part of, his, part of his, one of his descendants. None of, of us are part of Christ's geology, genealogy. But we all, with the other things we all share with Rahab. We were alien. When you're dead in your sins, you were outside of Israel. Not the Israel, but the new Israel, part of the kingdom of God. Because until you have faith, you're separated from God. You're lost in your sin, and you're outside the camp. But he has been the scapegoat for our sins. The, in the, in the, the sins could never be atoned for were dealt with with Jesus Christ. Sins that needed constant sacrifice were dealt with through Jesus Christ. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. He was killed for us. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Jesus sacrificed for you that you can be made right with him. But have you got a faith in Jesus Christ, an active faith? A faith that's pleasing him? All the blessings we have of being a Christian today. Where he defies his healing power, death and the curse are known no more. In him the tribes, tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. Do you know what blessings you have this morning if Jesus Christ is your saviour? You're right with God. You've been forgiven your sins. You have been made right with him. You will stand before him in eternity knowing that all is well. You have peace with God. Your sins have been taken on by Jesus Christ and you will worship him forever. You can call Jesus Christ your brother, and you've been sent another, you'll be passed to the bride of Christ, which presented to the Father in all its glory. But are you lost? Still outside the camp? We know when the, the people were brought out, we know what reading elsewhere in Joshua, that the family of Rahab were brought out of the flat, out of the house, and put outside of the camp. We know that at some point, Rahab came back out inside the camp because she married an Israelite and became part of the genealogy of Jesus. But maybe her family didn't. And the question is, are we outside the camp? Are we still sinners that have not been saved? We're all sinners this morning. Nobody can take that title away from us. But are we sinners that have not been saved? Oh, come to him. Repent of your sins and you will find his service of faithful and you'll be forgiven your sins. Amen.